Um, if you've got a phone, which is probably, I'd say, 95% of you, would you hold it up? We're in a concert, to, you know, turn on the lights. No, don't turn on your lights. That'll waste your batteries. Hold up your phone if you've got a phone. And turn to your neighbor on the right and hand it to them. <laughs> Everyone's like, what? <laughs> All right, everyone done it? All good? Some, some of you are like, no, I just bought that phone this week. <laughs> latest iPhone, latest Android. Okay, everyone, give me a nod if you've handed over your phone. All right, okay. Can I have the next slide? Turn to the person you gave your phone to and say, can I have my phone back? <laughs> And then let's have the next slide. Tell that person it's not yours. <laughs> well, today my sermon title is called Let's Talk About Tithing. It's not yours. Okay, I'm, I'm really blessed to be able to kick off a brand new sermon series. Everyone say new. new. Called Sacred Trust. Let's bring up this, uh, the next slide. This, this next few weeks, we're going to cover the topic of financial stewardship. And um, it's called Sacred Trust, and the subtitle is Our Stewardship Reflects Our Relationship. So I want to cover a few verses around this, and, and you know, the topic of tithing can be quite sensitive. You know, a lot of Christians might have different points of views on this, but I want to bring to you every nation Auckland City's view and position and posture around the topic of tithing. Some of you are get, getting ready to run. That's okay. <laughs> We're not going to force you anything on you. But I hope that you will open your heart to hear what I have to share with you uh, in the next few moments. Let's start by reading the scripture here, and it's okay, you can remain seated. I want to read this to you, and I want to start by reading from the book of Genesis chapter 14, that the concept of tithing started way back in the very first book of the New Test uh, Old Testament called Genesis, Genesis 14 verse 17 to 20, and I want to set this story up. There was a man called Abram, everyone say Abram. Abram was a great man, wealthy man. Abram was a businessman, and he had lots of uh, cattle and sheep and property. And Abram had a wife, Sarai. And the Bible speaks about the, this couple wanting to have a child. And for many, many years, they couldn't have a child. And the story in Genesis profiles and talks about Abram and his wife not only about their quest to have a child, it also talks about their relationship with some of their relatives. And it says that Abraham, or Abram had a nephew called Lot. And his nephew and him moved into this area, and God prospered them. Both of them started to prosper with lots of property, lots of land. And both of them decided to go their separate ways where they can continue to grow their, pro their, their wealth. Now, what happened was there was a war between some kings in those areas that they were living in, and Abram's nephew Lot was captured and brought into captivity. He was basically taken as a slave. And so when Abram heard that, he gathered some of his fighting men, his, his little military um, people that protects him, and he got those men to come and help fight against the enemy to rescue his nephew. And because God was with Abram, God blessed him, God gave him the ability to defeat the enemy and rescue his nephew Lot. So here we pick it up in Genesis chapter 14, verse 17 to 20, and it says this. After his return from the defeat of Chedorlaomer and the kings who were with him, the king of Sodom went out to meet him at the valley of Shavah, that is the king's valley, 
and Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. Melchizedek was the priest of God Most High. And Melchizedek blessed him and said, Blessed be Abram by God Most High, possessor of heaven and earth. And blessed be God Most High, who has delivered your enemies into your hand. And Abram gave him a tenth of everything. So basically, when Abram rescued, defeated the enemy and rescued his, his nephew Lot, he basically gathered all the property that was confiscated by the enemy and brought it back to be returned. And because he defeated the enemy, he, he owned all of this property. And when Melchizedek, the king of Salem, who is also a priest, blessed him as he came back, Melchizedek said, Blessed be Abram by God Most High. This priest gave credit to God for helping Abram defeat the enemy. And the first thing it says here in Genesis chapter 14, it says, Abraham gave a tenth of everything, all the loot that he got back. He gave a tenth to the priest. So this is the very first mention of tithing in the Bible. And there's a principle called the principles of first mention. When you study the Bible, this principle of first mention talks about the fact that in any topic, if you want to know what it really means, you go to the first mention of that word and you pick up the principles of what it says back then and then you trace it throughout the Bible to find other instances where this, this word is mentioned. So this was the first mention of tithing in the Bible. And then the next verse We'll pick it, pick it up in Malachi. Everyone say Malachi. Malachi chapter 3, verse 7 to 9. And this is a very, very famous verse that every time if you hear someone talk about tithing, this is the verse they talk about. And I want to give you a little bit of background before I get to the very popular verse that we always hear. So Malachi chapter 3, verse 7 to 9 says this. From the days of your fathers... You have turned aside from my statutes and have not kept them. Okay? So this was written to the Israelites. Okay? So the listeners of this, this passage were the Israelites. So it says, from the days of your fathers, you, the Israelites, have turned aside from my statutes and have not kept them. Basically, they have not obeyed God. And then it goes on to say, return to me. This is God saying it. And I will return to you, says the Lord of hosts. But you say, how shall we return? Will man rob God? Yet you are robbing me. But you say, how have we robbed you? And God said, in your tithes and your contributions, you are cursed with a curse, for you are robbing me, the whole nation of you. And moving on to the popular verse, Malachi chapter 3, verse 10, and God says to, to the Israelites, it says, bring the full tithe, the word means 10%, bring the full tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house and thereby put me to the test, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open the, heaven, the windows of heaven for you and pour down for you a blessing until there is no more need. You see, why did God say to Israel, Return to me, and the first thing he says in terms of returning to him was about tithing. Do you think God needed money? Did you th do you think that back in those days, before banks were a thing, that you know God's storehouse was somehow low? No, right? This God, if you believe in God and the God of the Bible, it says. This God owns the cattle on a thousand hills. He's the, God, he's the God that created heavens and the earth, right? He owns everything. Why would God say to his people, Israel, that to return to me, you need to give your tithes? I would suggest the principle here is not that God needs money. I would suggest that there's a principle here that God was saying, the way that you can obey me is through your tithes. And I would suggest that often 
In the New Testament, there, there, there's a passage that says, where your heart is, there your, your treasure is. That I would suggest that, like me, I'm sure you would be the same, that when you look at your material positions, your wealth and your money, so often we think, this is mine. That is of value to me. That if someone takes it from you, like the phone that you used your hard-earned money to buy, you would be quite uncomfortable to just give it away. So my suggestion to us all is that God didn't need the money. He was speaking about disobedience. He was speaking about how his chosen people, Israel, had not obeyed him, and then he was giving them the way to return to him. Does that make sense? That the way to return to him was to demonstrate obedience through giving of a tithe. Like, I don't know why God didn't say, give me 20% or 11.25% or 33.33%, right? I don't know that like God could have asked for anything, but I would hazard a guess that God was dealing with the idea of obedience because our treasure represents our heart and our heart represents our obedience. Amen? So let's talk a little bit about some of the common objections to tithing. So often I would talk to people and they'll come up to me and say, you know, um, I'm really uncomfortable, um, we young about tithing because, you know, I, I think it's an Old Testament thing, you know? When we celebrated the new covenant, like when Jesus came and died and rose again, he abolished all the law, so it's, you know, we don't have to follow it anymore. You know, I guess I have a, 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 an issue about that because, you see, even though tithing in the Old Testament was given as an example, it didn't say that if you don't tithe, that you're sinning, right? So those two verses, that chapters that we read earlier, one talked about Abram. It, it gave an example. It just says Abram tithed, right? It didn't say if you don't do like Abram, you're, you're a bad person, right? It didn't say that. And in Malachi, it spoke more about obedience. Yet again, it gives tithing, the 10%, as an example. And here, the statement, it's only in the Old Testament, I would say, well, actually, it's not, not correct. Because if you turn to the first book of the New Testament in Matthew, chapter 23, verse 23, it says this. Jesus was speaking to a bunch of religious leaders or lawyers called Pharisees, and he said this to them. He said, woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You give a tenth of your spices, mint, dill, and cumin, but you've neglected the most important matters of the law, justice, mercy, and faithfulness. You should have practiced the latter without neglecting the former. What is, he, what is he saying here? He's saying to the Pharisees or the religious leaders that were self-righteous. They knew the law back to front. They were uh, legal lawyers back in the days, and they would strut around like, I know the law, I'm so close to God, you know, I'm the man. You know, the law was... There was something like 633 laws or something like that. They, they studied these religious leaders. They felt they pat themselves on the back and they dress up and everything. And they felt like just because they knew the law, they were much better than everyone else. And Jesus, I love how Jesus always takes down the self-righteous people. He's like, you hypocrites. You hypocrites. Even though you, on the outside, tithe, Right? You didn't, you didn't do all these other things that were important. You've neglected justice, mercy, and faithfulness. And then Jesus says you should have done that, justice, mercy, and faithfulness, without neglecting the former, which is what? To tithe. What testament is this in? The New Testament. So if people say, oh, it's only in the Old Testament and it's not in the New Testament, bring them to Matthew chapter 23, verse 23. It's quite easy to remember. 23 verse 23, twice, okay? First book of the New Testament. It's there. 
Now, does it say if you don't tithe, you're a bad person, you're a sinner, and you're going to hell? No, no, it doesn't. No, it doesn't. You see, tithing is not, it's not a matter of sociology. It's not a matter of salvation, right? It's a matter of the heart. Do you think God needs our money? You see, I think it's more for us that he has this example or this, this practice called tithing. It's more for us than it is for him because so often we can get so tied to our treasures. We can get so precious about our things. We, get, we could get so fixated on working so hard to buy a house which is not bad. I like property. I like investing. But then once you get that house, then what? Then you, then you save hard and you work hard and you, you try to pay for your children to go to school, which is really noble and really important. And then what? And then you try really, really, really hard to save up and to, 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 to aim towards a, an overseas holiday. Did you know that holidays finish? You know, you go and you come back, and then you save really, really, really hard to try to upgrade your car to the next hybrid model or a Tesla. And then what? And then suddenly you wake up and you realize that a decade has gone by in your life that you've spent the last decade working hard for things. You see, all of these things, these desires, aren't bad things. Like it says in Matthew 22, 23, you know, doing all of these things, they're good. But you've neglected the former, the tithing. What does that mean? I, again, I don't believe that God needs our money. I think he's talking about the concept of obedience. Obedience to God. Obedience to His purposes for us. Obedience to His command to us to serve Him. And tithing is just a simple example or a start that represents where our heart is at. I remember when I had my first job, I worked at a supermarket called Woolworths. And then it became Countdown. And now it's going to become Woolworths again. Millions of dollars to rebrand. And I earned $4.13 an hour. I was in year 12 or sixth form at the time, 16 years old. I worked 10 hours. So simple math tells you that's $43.10. I tithed on that. And I used to think, what can God use with my $6 or something that I tithe each week? But then I did it anyway. And then I got a pay rise. I, I jumped from $4.13 an hour to $5.30. Can you imagine how happy I was? So if you're thinking minimum wage is a little bit sad, please, please spare a thought for people that lived over 25 years ago. And then I tithe on that. Fast forward, I got my first job after uni. I earned $35,000 a year before tax, working for one of the largest companies in the world. Bought my first suit. So proud of that. I tithe on that. I remember about 10 years ago, almost 11 years ago now, when, when God called us into full-time ministry, I left my work at an insurance company as a senior executive. And I took up the process of the Ministry of Partnership Development where I would go and raise my own salary. So I went from a very, very good salary to no salary for a period of time while I was raising enough money to serve God and to serve this church. And during that time, I had a dilemma, right? No salary, 10% on zero is. 
But I remember in my time of prayer, God said, I want you to keep on tithing. Tithe on the amount that you are aiming for. And I had a debate with God. I was like, God, you don't need the money. You know, let me off for a bit, you know? I was like, just give me, just give me a few, few months, you know? But at the same time, I was believing God to open doors of the heavens to pour out His blessing upon me so I can have a salary, a single income salary to feed my kids and to pay the bills. So I had this debate with God. I remember just like, Lord, please. And I knew that God would not be upset with me or punish me if I did not tithe at the time. But I thank God for my wife that's a lot, a lot more righteous than I am. And she reminded me that it's not ours anyway. That God will come through. But our role is to be obedient. So I tithe. I tithe from our savings that was dwindling by the day. Now again, when we obey God, there's not a guarantee that He's going to bless us and give us everything we want at the time that we want, exactly how we want, to the amount that we want, right? But the crazy thing is that, you know, different people that know this testimony is that if we set aside almost a year to raise the amount that I needed, to serve God in that capacity, three and a half months later, God provided everything. Let's give the Lord a big hand. And you know, people would ask me, so what did you do, Weyong? How did you raise that amount of money, which was not a lot, it was a third of what I used to earn. How did you raise that in three and a half months? And I just said, I was dumb enough to follow the training that was provided by Shandell and the team. I used all the templates, I made the phone calls, I had the coffees, I cast the vision. And when I look back, it was just absolutely miraculous. And that's just one of the many testimonies over my lifetime, over our lifetime, where God has said, do it. And we would do it. Not, not expecting anything in return. But when I look back on my 45 years of life, God has always come through over and over and over and over again. We're not wealthy, but God has provided and He will continue to provide. But it's an aspect and a focus on obedience, isn't it? Amen? God doesn't need our money. He's looking for our obedience. Another common ob objection to tithing, and I'm coming to, to land the plane shortly, is people say it's, it's not about the, the amount, it's about the heart. And I say, okay, well, let's look at some verses in the New Testament, particularly Luke chapter 6, verse 38. If it's not about the amount, as in like, it's not really about 10%, it could be less. That's what people mean when they say that. Look at Luke chapter 6, verse 38. It says, give, and it will give, be given to you a good measure, pressed down. Everyone say pressed down. Shaken together. And running over. Come on. You want some run over? You want some, some running over in your life? Let's do it again. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. So now, do you think 10% in the tip jar is going to run over? No. You see, in the New Testament, that's the measure of God's require, uh, require, well, request for generosity. It's a running over kind of generosity that, he, that he's talking about. So if people say, well, actually, tithing, it's really not about the amount. Well, actually, if you want to take the New Testament standard on it, then, then why don't you give to the point that it runs over? Right? You see, God gave us 100% to work with, including our, ta our taxes. All he's asking for us to represent our obedience as a start is 10%. A couple of slides around why I think sometimes we think tithing is difficult. The first one is that that's the world's economy and God's economy, right? The world's economy starts with self. It starts with me working really hard to earn the money. And once I earn the money, once I got the promotion, then I deserve it. It's mine. But God's economy reminds us that everything comes from God. Our 
very ability to actually work, our health to keep a job, our intelligence to remember stuff, our favor to connect with people if you're a business person. All of that comes from God. Whereas the world's economy says it's you. If you work hard, then you earn the money and you deserve it because that's why people work. They go on a holiday, they buy things, and they work again. And that cycle goes round and round. How fun is that? <laughs> right? Why else is tithing difficult? Well, on our end, it's about entitlement. See, we, we're entitled to this because we worked hard for it. We deserve it, right? God's economy is stewardship. It talks about the fact that He's given us the 100% to look after. He's given us everything to steward. The word steward means to look after something, care for it. And finally, why is tithing difficult? Well, I guess the world tells us that if we need to do it, we'll do it out of obligation because we have to. You know, I have to tithe because to be a good Christian, you know. Otherwise, you know, my connect group leader is going to call me and, you know, like the, <laughs> like the bailiffs, they're going to call and collect the tithes, you know. No, we're not going to check on your tithing. It's an obligation, or is it gratitude that God has provided everything, and it's a joy for me to give? Well, what if we own, I can't afford it, and it's a real thing, and I want to acknowledge how difficult it is for everyone at the moment in this economy. Lots of people are losing jobs. Lots of people have, have not had a pay rise for a while. What if I can't afford it? Well, I want to encourage us that like anything, the tough times will come and go. And, you know, God doesn't require to, you to suffer just because you need to tithe. But there are options. Why don't you talk to your connect group leaders? Because you want to joyfully obey God but you don't know how to. Have a chat with your connect group leader. Have a chat with a leader in this church. There have been moments where we've said to someone, look, because they want to tithe, they're just struggling. What we did as a church was we gave them for a, mo for a period of time some money from this church to help them get through that period of life, to buy groceries, to pay rent, but that enabled them to tithe so that on their end, they were obeying God. Does that make sense? Like as a church, we would rather do that to help you continue to obey God rather than for you to secretly feel shame that I'm not tithing because I can't afford it. Does that make sense? This is a very sensitive topic, so I don't want to labor upon this, but I want to encourage you, if you are struggling with some of these things, please talk to one of your leaders. We would be most happy to help you, to give you options, to help you obey God, right? Because it's not about the money. God doesn't need our money. Okay, so the practical view of tithing, just like your taxes, tithing really should be de deducted before our spending. And then within that, we live within our means. We live within our means. You go to any finan financial course, it will tell you about living within, within your means. There were moments that we've had to cut our spending to budget, you know, to live within our means. So just to wrap it all up, tithing is not a financial issue. It's an obedience issue, as I've mentioned before. It's about trust, our trust in God that he will provide and he'll come through. 